Welcome everyone. Good evening, a good Nerv Shabbos. As uh, we welcome you in the name of Hashem and with the help of Hashem to our weekly shir. Uh, thanks to TorahAnytime.com who streams the shir live, making it available in over 180 countries. And of course, thank you to Chazak for advertising the shir all over. Uh, this week's sponsors uh, came very late. I actually put it out on uh, Facebook, and uh, we want to thank, uh, in order of those that uh, came forward, Richard and Sharna Rosenzweig, my uh, dear former Ms. Palm and wonderful Zoom Talmidim, uh, who, who are being partial sponsors uh, with the wish that Hashem should bring bracha, Hatzlach and Gesund to their family, and uh, also a partial sponsorship for my Zoom Daft Talmud, Steve Holtzman and family, uh, with appreciation to the Shear and a refuah for all those that need it. And then uh, my uh, dear Talmud, Beirich Goldwasser, came forward and asked me to learn in memory of two people that sadly passed away recently, Mishka. Bas Yitzchak Abba Halevi and Rebbe Rufal Ruvain Ben Ben Yo that the Neshama should have an Aliyah they should have a Lichte Gegan Eden and uh, be Melitza Yoshev for their family for all of us and all of Klal Yisrael again there is no sponsor for next week if you would like to sponsor please early uh, Matzah Shabbos Sunday uh, the latest Monday morning text or call 718 916-3100, or to my email, rmmwsi, that's Rabbi Moshe Meir Weiss, Staten Island, at aol.com. Uh, if you saw the announcements of uh, this week's share, the share is a special one since we just started Svira, and as we know, the count of Svira is multifaceted. Of course, it's our passionate expression of our pining for Torah. In America, they say baseball is the American pastime. And indeed, people all over the country and all over the world, they count down uh, with excitement towards opening day. And they think about their favorite ballparks and uh, bringing their family to the games. That's the uh, American pastime. Uh, a kala will count down to her, it's her wedding day. A child might count down to camp. Uh, we as Jews, the Jewish pastime is Torah. And what we long for and what we pine for and what, what we count down with anticipation is to Tares Hashem, is to Shavuos. But we also know that when we left Mitzrayim, we were uh, really in very dire spiritual straits. We know that uh, we were at the 49th degree of Tumah. That's why we had to get out exactly exactly at midnight, because if we didn't, we would have sunk to the 50th degree of Tumah, which would be spiritual ruination and, God forbid, a point of no return. And therefore, we... Uh, were whisked out, Bachatzais, exactly at midnight. Uh, at least we were whisked out from the Shiba Mitzrayim. Physically, we didn't leave till the next morning. But uh, then we did the spiritual climb of 49 days of uh, personal improvement to be worthy to greet Hashem at Har Sinai and to accept the Torah. And therefore, uh, Throughout the ages, the days of Svira were also associated with times of personal improvement and uh, character perfection. And that's why uh, we start learning Pirkei Ovis at this juncture. Because as the world begins to blossom and the trees once again come to life, we also try to blossom and to perfect ourselves as best as we can spiritually since in this fabric of time there was that 
uh, climb to improvement from the very low state that we were in at uh, Harasina, at, at, at when we left Mitzrayim, to our spiritual uh, zenith at Harsinai. Therefore, since they asked Rav Chaim Vital, how could you tell a person's character? And uh, we would think from the uh, number one Talmud of the Arizal, uh, we would think that he would offer us some kind of a mystical answer. Well, let me look at your forehead, let me read your pa- palm, let me peruse your ksuva, bring me your mezuzah, but none of the sort. Rav Chaim Betal said, let me see how a person treats their spouse, and that's how I can tell you their character. Because the whole kaleidoscope of personal midos, from temperament to patience, to attention, to warmth, to uh, laziness, greed, uh, selfishness, self-centeredness, is all uh, comes to play in uh, one's handling of Shalom Bayes. And therefore, today's shear is going to be a special one-time shear, I believe it will be one time, on the subject of Shalom Bayes. Now, this is a matter of tremendous importance. It's not, you know, one aspect of life. There's a famous Gemara in the sixth parak of Yavamas. The Gemara says, Hashari Beloi Isha, if somebody lives without a wife, Shari Beloi Simcha, they live without happiness, Shari Beloi Toiva, they live without goodness, Shari Beloi Bracha, they live without blessing, and Shari Beloi Shalom, without peace. Now the stipler of Zechitzadim Kaisha Racha Schusu Yogan Alena was asked an interesting question. He says, is it only somebody that lives without a wife? What about somebody that lives without Shalom Bayis? So the stipler Gain said succinctly, the Gemara doesn't mean only a bachelor. It doesn't only mean a single, a widow, a divorcee, a widower. It also means somebody that's living without uh, tranquility. Because without tranquility, that's like living without a wife. That's like living without a husband. And the result is, is there's no simcha, there's no taiva. And the Gemara says the very, uh, it, it, it has such a ring of finality, is shari belay shalom. I told you once in this year, that Reb Shlema Mibabov, who was a great champion of Shalom Bayis, said there's only one place in the entire Torah where it says loitayv. It's not good. Because we understand that the Rabbi Shalom said, Ve'yares kol so he saw everything that he made, v'hinei toiv ma'ayv. It was all very good. Everything is good. You know, that's an explanation of the unusual Gemara. The Gemara says that if a person says halal every day, if a person says halal every day, he is committing blasphemy against Hashem. And that's a very hard Gemara to understand. I mean, halal is from the time the sun shines until it, it sets. Mahulal Shem Hashem. Hashem's name should be praised. I mean, how could that be blasphemy? But, but the answer is, is that Hallel is for open miracles. If a person says Hallel every day, that means he's implying, she's implying, that Hashem needs to make open miracles all the time in order, in order to plug holes and problems in creation. That's blasphemy. Hashem's world doesn't have holes. It's perfect. He doesn't have to make open miracles. Everything was already seen from the beginning. Whatever the world needed, Hashem created. There's nothing new under the sun. 
Right? Hashem is mechadesh b'chol yom tom in ma'ase b'reishis. Hashem, who is yodea asidus, he knew everything that would be needed. So to imply that Hashem has to constantly make open miracles in order to uh, solve unforeseen problems, there's no such thing as an unforeseen problem to the Rabbi Nishalayla. That's blasphemy. That's mechav. So the world is good. But the Baba Verebbe said, there's one place where it says loitayv. Loitayv heyay adam levada. It's not good for man to be alone. That's not good. And therefore, the subject of Shalom Bayis is one that our very peace is at stake. Now, peace is very important because it says in Rashi and Bechukaisai, it ain't Shalom, ain't Klum. If there's no peace, there's nothing. That's why we make a bracha, the longest bracha in davening. You know, people don't realize what the longest bracha in davening is. They start thinking, what's the longest? The longest bracha in davening is the bracha that we make on the sun. And it extends a long time, right? We say, Tis Baruch Tzareinu. We say, Kaddish, Kaddish, Kaddish. All, all the way, Lekel Baruch Nimas, until we say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Yoytzer HaMa'oyres. But when we thank Hashem for the sun, you know, the sun picks up people's spirits. You know, here in the Northeast, uh, we've been having some really sunny, nice days. And you go out, and just going out in the sun, it lifts your spirits. So in that bracha we say, what's the bracha? Yoytzer Ovarei Oise Shalom, Hashem makes peace, Ovarei Yasakal. And it's explained, why is... Uh, next to Shalom, Bari Asakal, he creates everything because Shalom is equal to everything. It ain't Shalom, ain't Klum. As Rabbi Wein once interestingly said, you go to a store like Costco and they don't give you bags. If you don't have bags, how are you going to take the stuff home? Shalom is the bag to carry everything. As it says at the end of Shas, the last teaching is in Shas, in Mesechus Uksen, is Ein Keli Marzik Bracha, the utensil that stores blessing, El Shalom. That's peace. Now, some people will say, well, it's not in the cards for me. It's not in the cards for me. I didn't look out or I was too young when I made my choice, and uh, it's already too late for me. We have to know that you're married, it's Bashet. People make a mistake of what it means by Bashet. And people say, well, if it's Bashat, why did I spend so much time checking out about the Shidduch? If it's Bashat, it's going to happen. That's not true. If that was true, then you could cross Ocean Parkway on a red light and say, if it's Bashat for me to live, the three lanes going one way and three lanes going the other way, all the, all the, all the cars will get flat tires. Don't do that. You'll become a pancake. Because although things were decided on Rosh Hashanah, but we have to do what's called Hishtadlis. We have to make our uh, satisfactory attempt in order to get the blessings that are supposed to come. And therefore the same thing is true, even though 40 days before the creation of the embryo, a basco goes out and says that this bas plaini le plaini, this person is supposed to go to this person. If a person doesn't date, they sit on their easy chair and say, look, I got a, I got a bashet. It's going to come to me through the window. That person is going to die a bachelor. You have to make your ishtadlis. So then what is bashet? Bashet is for afterwards. The one that you end up with most of the time, over 95% of the time, the one that you end up with 
is the one that you were supposed to have. That means that Hashem designed that person for you. And that means that if we live correctly, then we could have great happiness. Because that's Hashem made that we should be happy in our marriage. This is taif. Matza isha, matza taif. Right? That's what it says. You find a, a woman, you find goodness. Now, this is especially true when a person has good children. You know, when Yaakov had that frightening encounter with Esav, and Yaakov lined up the children and the wives. So Esav asked Yaakov a queer question. He asked Yaakov, Mi Eileloch, who are these to you? That's a strange question. Who do you think they are? The mailman's children? It's a queer question. And Yaakov gave him a queer answer. Habonim asher chanan elikim esavdecha. The children that Hashem grace to your servant. These are my children. But Esav didn't only ask about the children. He asked about the four wives. About Rachel, Leah, Bila, and Zilpah. So one of the G'dayle Admirim of yesteryear says an amazing pshat. When Esav said, Mi Eila Lach, he was hinting, Eila, Aleph, Lamed, Hay, is the same letters as Leah. And he was saying to Yaakov, Mi Leah Remember, we were twins and Rachel and Leah were twins. And they said the older one is for the older one and the younger one was for the younger one. So Esav said, I was supposed to get Leah. What are you doing with Leah? That's what he meant by Mi Eilelach. Mi Leah You weren't supposed to get Leah. So Yaakov turned to the sh- six Shvatim. Remember, Dina was hidden in a box. But he turned to the six Shvatim, the Ruvain, you know, Shimon Levi, Uda, all the six Shvatim that he had from Leah. And he said, If Leah was not meant to be for me, would God have given me such six beautiful children? When you have good children, that's a sign that it's Bashat. That's a sign that it's meant to be. Now, there are people out there that are wondering, okay, Rabbi Weiss, but I'm in a second marriage. What you said doesn't seem to apply to me. The whole discussion doesn't seem to apply to me because uh, it's, it's, I don't have children for my second marriage. And you can't say that a Basco came out and said that uh, we were meant for each other because it's a second marriage, not a first marriage. So the Gemara addresses a second marriage also. And the Gemara says, Zivik Shani Lafi Masim. Second marriage is according to your behavior. It's very important to understand. The Rabbi Shalom gives us a second marriage according to what we've earned in life. So if you think that you're living a good life, so then you could be assured that the Rabbi Nishalayim is giving you good. However, I must tell you, and this might be a little bit of a downer, marriage to be good is not natural. There are things in life that are natural. But marriage is not natural. It doesn't come uh, just by itself. A person has to work very hard on a marriage. So, f- First of all, we must know that every day the Yitzhahara attacks us. Yitzray shall adam miskaber alav bechal yoyim. A person's Yitzhah that tries to get mess them up, prevails upon a person every day. Now, in what area? So here we have a big clue. The Yetzirah attacks, the Yetzirah is selective. 
and the Yitzhar attacks where he could do the most damage. And that's based on the famous statement from the Chavetz Chaim, who says that the Yitzhar is not lazy. The Yitzhar is not lazy. Uh, he's up before us telling us not to get up. He's up all the way at the end of the day, fresh and vital, telling us not to go to sleep. Yetzar is not lazy. So ask the Chavetz Chaim, why didn't the Yetzar fight with Avram or Yitzchak? He delayed fighting until with Yaakov, then Samkel, Samuel, Why did he wait? Why did he procrastinate? So the Chavetz Chaim, Zechitzav Kereshev Rachas Chusu Yag and Aleinu, says the great fundamental principle. The Yitzhahara is selective. He says, I could live with Avram's chesed. I could even live with Yitzchak Zavoida, but not with Yaakov's Torah. That's open warfare. And therefore, you know, people say, I don't know, I get along with everybody. I can't get along with my spouse. That's, that's a fact of life. Because the Yitzhara says, I'll let you get along with everybody. It's like the child that tells the Rebbe, you know, it must be my parents. I get along with my Rebbeim, I get along with my friends, my parents I can't get along with. It must be that they're at fault. And the Rebbe tells him, it's not that way. But rather, the Yitzhara says, I'll let you get along with your friends. But with your parents? <laughs> because why? Here's the thing. I remember when I came to Staten Island, it's almost 40 years ago, and I started giving shear first by Rabbi Pollock. And I had people, and they said to me that they hadn't opened the Gemara in 20 years. And I looked aghast. But the truth of the matter is, is that the Yed Sahara says, okay, let me see, what should I pick? Oh, it says, I can't have the person with Shechina. I'll let him do a lot of things, but not Torah. Torah, I'm going to get, no, you're not cut out, you don't have Zitzvah. It's the same thing with Shalom Bayes. Ish ve'isha, Shalom b'neim, Shechina shruya b'neim. That's why, the yud of the ish and the hay of the isha converge and you give you ka, the shem Hashem. And ka is a special name of Hashem because the Gemara Menachah says, ki beka Hashem tzur oilamim. With the ka Hashem created two worlds. With the yud he created oilam abo, with the hay he created oilam azeh. So the yud of the ish and the hay of the isha converge in order to give us shtei shulchanais. So the Yetzirah says, no, 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 that I can't have. You can get along with your friends. You can get along with others, even with your, your children. That's okay. Your husband, your wife, no, that's warfare. And the same thing when a child is growing up. A child is growing up. It says, if there's kibbutz of aim in the house, then Hashem says, for sisi shedarti b'neim. It's good that I lived amongst you. But if not, Hashem says, get me out of here. So the Shechina is at stake. So the Yetzirah starts up when it comes to Kibbut Ain. Now, it's very important to recognize this. Because if we recognize that it's not easy, that it's not natural, and that we have to work on it, so then we'll make a concerted effort to work on it. And here is another important uh, yesaid of a career of Shalom Bayes. And that is that a person has to have rotzain. A person has to have a fierce will to have Shalom Bayes. There's a lot at stake because a man, when he gets to the next world, Hashem is going to ask him, Were you Mikhaim v'simach es ishtai? And when a woman gets to the next world, Hashem is going to ask her, so were you an Azer Kenegdai? Were you a helper? Or when your husband was down, he couldn't count you, on you at all. What were you? And that's going to be, an etern- our eternity is going to hinge on those questions. Right? So therefore, 
we have to know that we have to have a rotten because the guy famously said that embedded in the word voracious is the six most important pursuits of life. Four of the six are simple. The base is betochen, the aleph is ava, the yud is yira, the toughest is taira. It's the reish and the shin that are very novel. The shin, I would have for sure thought that the gain would say it's shalom or simcha, but no. The gain says the shin is shtika, the ability to know when to be quiet. But it's the Reish that I want to talk to you about. He doesn't say Rachmanis. He doesn't say Ruchnias. The Reish, he says, is Ratzang. A person first has to have the will. You know, they say over from Rav Nachman Mabreslev, Ain Dover Oymeid Bifnei Aratzang. Nothing stands in front of a good will. And the Gemara tells us, The way a person wants to go, that's the way they are led. If a person makes up their mind, I'm on a mission. I'm going to make my home a happy one. I'm going to make an aura of cheerfulness. Then Hashem helps. That's Hashem helps. We create a reality. Our will is a very important step. Now there's something else. And that is, we're living in a very busy world. It's a very busy world. You know, before the cell phone, before the cell phone, before fast cars, already Reb Shamsh, before emails. Imagine a world without cell phones and emails and, and Instagram and Twitter and and. and and Facebook, and world, before any of these things were ever heard of, Rav Shamshin Rafal Hirsch, Zechotzadik Levrach, Eskutsu Yagen Aleinu, said, this world is called Aretz because of ruts. We're running. From cradle to grave, we're running. Indeed, one of the greatest weapons of the Yetzirah is the Mesilz Yisharim says that Paro is a symbol of the Yetzirah. And he says from, from a study of power, this is a level to learn the parashia is in Shmais. He says from a study of power you can learn the tricks and, 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 and devices of the eight strategies of the eight Tzar. So when Moshe Rabbeinu said that he wants us to go out for a three-day convention, so Paro said, what? You're still talk, thinking about religion? They have to work harder. They have time on their hand to think. I don't want them to think. That's what the Yetzirah does. The Yetzirah gets us too busy. Too busy to think about what's important. I remember in the 90s, it was on 16th Avenue, and I gave a share to about 500 women about Shalom Bayes. Uh, and uh, I told them a recent poll that was taken. This is, again, remember, in the 1990s. Again, before the cell phones, before they asked, it was a, 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 a secular uh, poll to about 82,000 American families with two children, a mother, a father, and two children. They asked... This was, I, I studied this uh, survey, and this to me was by far the most interesting question. And you know, a, a survey is as good as how honest the people would be in their answer. And if we have to look at a question where people would be comfortable to answer honestly. And this wasn't, uh, you know, a question where people felt, at least I think, where people felt that they had to lie. So they asked a week, how much time do you spend with your spouse alone outside of the bedroom? The national average 
was 19 minutes a week. This is before the cell phone. 19 minutes a week. And I remember that there was a woman in the crowd that said, I remember she said, so much. So much. A younger woman, so much. We have to know that you cannot forge a unique bond of closeness without time. You have to make time for each other. You know that marital intimacy is alluded to in the Torah when it says, She'era ksusa v'einasa lo yigra. Onasa, it's a machlaikas in the Gemara, whether intimacy is indicated by she'era or einasa. But ona means time. You have to give time. If something is important, you have to give time to it. Uh, I made the comment, and it's one that people might have found it strange. It's not natural to have a good marriage. It's not. Take, for example, I always tell people, think of a person in in your life that you enjoy being with. A lot of people have a favorite aunt or uncle. Now, why do they enjoy being with that person? Because that person says nice things about them. You know, I always knew that you were special. I always knew you would amount to something special. We like being around people that give us compliments. It's just the way it is. We are uncomfortable with people that criticize. We, we're, not, we're not comfortable to be around people that criticize us. That's the way it is. It makes us uncomfortable. Sometimes there's a woman that gets into Chinese auctions and all kinds of things outside of the house because she just can't take it anymore. She's always criticized. So... They can't take it. But you have to know that it's so natural to criticize, it's not natural to compliment. Let me give you a simple example. It's a simple example. A man comes home, he's walking up the steps, and he has to climb over dirty laundry that's strewn on the steps. This is after a day's work. Then he comes into the kitchen, and the breakfast is still on the table, curled up leftovers of food. There's already a stench coming out of the food. Right? And he comes in and he said, what is this? The city dump? That's natural. It comes right out of his mouth. Or, I'll give you another example. Here's a man. He hasn't been at work, and his wife had it. She says to him, you know, I'm the laughing stock of the neighborhood. I go into the butcher. They tell me, when are you going to pay your bill? I tried to get into the grocery, but he stops me in front of everybody, and he says, please don't come into my store. It's a chutzpah that you could show up owing me so much money. And she comes home after being very, very embarrassed, and she turns to her husband and says, you know, it's really hard being married to a useless bum like you. How long do you want me to be embarrassed? All of that is very natural. Very natural. Now, let's look at the flip side. A man comes home, and the smell a fresh challah is wafting through the house. He meets his daughters that are ready, ready for Shabbos in matching dresses with pretty bows tied to perfection in their hair. The table is set. Does he wax eloquently? Wow, this is amazing. You know, you're such a balabasta. No, <laughs> that's the way it's supposed to be. If the bills are paid 
and there's no collection calls, is his wife saying, oh, you're such a provider. No. I mean, what, you, you expect that you should be a bum? So there is no incentive to compliment. There is a strong incentive to complain and to criticize when something is missing. So the, the lubrication that makes a marriage so enjoyable, the words of praise, by the way, this is, people have a, 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 a wrong idea of what it means in Aisha's Kyle. Pia Poska Bechachma. Her mouth opens with wisdom. People think that it means that, and the Seiras Chesed Alishayna, and the Torah of kindness is on her tongue. People think it means that she knows how to invite people and she knows how to make people at home at her table. The Seiras Chesed Alishayna is how a woman makes her husband feel. It's what it says, and I heard this from Ramiller. Ramiller said that there was a man that was constantly having stomach pains, and he was constantly burping. Finally, he went to the gastroenterologist, and the gastroenterologist scoped him, and they found many, many ulcers. So Ramilla would say, you know this man? It says in the Pasuk, Yesh boite kimat karois karev. There are those that speak and it's like the stabbing of a sword. Here's this woman. She would constantly nag him. When are you going to do this? Why can't you do that? When are you going to take care of this? Or why can't you be like this? Or why did you do this? And every time she said it, he would cringe. And by the way, sometimes she would be right. But the end result is, is that his home would be a place where he's constantly listening to criticism, to complaining, and he's constantly cringing. He said, Ramilla said, Yesh baita, the those that speak. And it's kemat karas karav. It's like a multiple stabbings. Uh, Shlom Amel finishes the Pasuk in Mishle. The tongue of the wise is healing. A person that says nice things. Now, again, this is not normal. It's absolutely not normal behavior. A person has to take the initiative to say nice things. It's not a, a complaint is normal. Why is the soup cold? Why didn't you remember to bring home what I asked you? That's all normal. Compliment, you know, the shopping was perfect. You even got what I forgot to tell you. We're not motivated to say that. It has to be self-motivated. It's very important. Now, it's not just what we say. In the Svardi Ksuva, we don't have it in the Ashkenaz Ksuva. By the way, if you're ever by a chasana and you get called up with the honor of reading a Svardi Ksuva, don't take the honor unless you read it before. Svardi Ksuva is very complicated. You'll break your teeth if you never read it before. But in the Svardi Ksuva, there's a clause that I wish we could add to the Ashkenaz Ksuva. In the Svardi Ksuva, there's a clause, Ana Asaber. I will smile. Simple thing. The Ashkenazim don't have this. Ana Asaber. I will smile. How important is a smile? Right, there's a Gemara at the end of Masech Ksuvas by the Gadol Ador Rabbi Yechina. Now, Rabbi, if anybody had a reason not to smile, it was Rabbi Yechina. Rabbi Yechina buried 
10 children during his lifetime, Loyalena. Famous statement that he used to go to comfort people that lost children. Dain Garma de Asiro Abir. This is the bone of my 10th child. His last child was scalded to death. He fell into a vat of boiling liquid and he was scalded to death. All, of, all that was left was bone. And yet Rabbi Yechenin quoted from the bracha of Yehuda, Yaakov's bracha to Yehuda, now the literal meaning of Leven Shinayim Mechalov means that the pasture land of Yehuda will be so rich that the milk from those cows that grazed on that pasture land will be so full of calcium that the teeth will be white in the Shevet of Yehuda. But Rabbi Yechenin says, read it, More important is to show the white of the teeth than to give milk. A smile in a home for children is more important than giving them milk in the morning. And we see that. We see that the development of children, when there was happiness around them, is a much different development. Children that grow up in a house where there was acrimony, they, 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 they're a lot of times scarred. But this Ulevoyin Shinayim Mechalov is, is not only for children that grow up in a home. It's more important to smile in a relationship than milk. That smile, that's why in the Svadish Suva, it says, Ana Asaber. Now, we must know that there are things that we would like to have in our marriage. So, in a short marriage here, how can I give you advice to see how the marriage could become more sweeter? So I like to tell over the story that the Baba Verebbe told Chassanin. This was a story that the Heilige Reb Shleimim above him, Zechit Tzadik Kaysh Racha, Tzchusi Yagen Aleinu. I used to have a picture of the Baba Verebbe on the wall. It's a Shem, I hope to have it again. He was, he was, he was the Ne'im Sheba It's so sweet. He told this story to Hassan. And the story is uh, reputed to be a true story about the Kremera Rebbe, Zech Tzadik, Levracha, Schusu Yogan Olein. And I added or verified that this was a story about the Kremera Rebbe. What happened was, is the Rebbe visited a small hamlet, a small town. And as a Chassidish man, he wanted to go to the mikveh. So he asked the townspeople, where's the mikveh? So the townspeople said, Rebbe, we're sorry, we don't have a mikveh in the town. So he looked shocked. He says, no mikveh in the whole town? So then he said, what do the women do? They said, Rebbe, they have to travel 30 miles to go to a mikveh. He says, how could it be a Jewish dot without a mikveh? He said, Rebbe, we're poor. We can't afford a mikveh. We can't afford the upkeep of a mikveh. You know, it's a the upkeep, the heat it, and the housing, we can't afford it. So he looked at them and he said, there's no wealthy man in town that could provide a mikvah, such a mitzvah. So he said, Rabbi, truthfully, there is one usher, there is one nugget, but he's a miser, he's a kamtsen. He won't give us money. So Rabbi smiled and he says, now I know why I'm here. I'm going to ask him for money. He said, Rebbe, please, no, it's busyness. It's busyness. He's not going to give. It's a waste of time. So the Rebbe said, listen, you know, if a person gets busyness, a little shame, it's mechapar avayness, it's okay. So the next day, the Rebbe makes an appointment and he comes to this man's house. Now, this man was no dummy. He recognized a world-class Rebbe when he saw one. So he opened his door wide. He said, Rebbe, just one thing before you come in, 
I just want to tell you that if it's anything to do about money, it's not my minig to give. You know, we believe in keeping it in the family. You know, he told them before he came in, you know. So the Rebbe said to him, you know, the truth of the matter is, is I came to offer you a bracha. So the man looked surprised and he said, really? Come on in, we have to speak about this. So he comes in, takes him into, you know, his uh, office. It's like, you know, from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you know, the, the crimson hangings, the big Queen Elizabeth mahogany desk, you know, fancy uh, cushioned armchairs, you know, the, 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 the golden, the, the, the golden uh, ropes alongside the, the drapes, the, 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 the sweeping chandelier. He said, Rebbe, please sit down. The Rebbe sits down. He says, now that the Rebbe is offering me a boon. So Rebbe said, not a boon. Ah, give me a bracha for my Hashem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do need something. So the Rebbe is curious. A man that has all of this, what could you want? He said, well, if the Rebbe is ready to give me a bracha, please give me a bracha that my wife should die. So the Rebbe looks at him. And he says, you must know that I'm not in the habit of giving such blessings. He says, the Rebbe's backing out? He says, look, I, I can't give you a blessing that your wife should die. That's not in the cards. But I can give you advice. Maybe if you follow my advice, maybe she'll die. He said, okay, I'm all ears. So, well, the Gemara says that Hanoider ve'ena mishalem, if somebody makes vows and doesn't pay, his wife dies. So I'd suggest that you should make a very big promise and then don't keep it, maybe she'll die. So the man was all a smile and he said, Rebbe, you're a genius. Now I know why you're such a big Rebbe. You want to give me a suggestion why I should promise? How, do I, how, do, how does this process work? So the Rebbe says, I know exactly what you should do. Go to Shul to Shabbos and in front of everybody promise to build a state-of-the-art new mikvah for the city, and then don't build it. He said, Rebbe, I'm going to be in your debt for life. So the Rebbe stays in the town, and the man comes to shul, and he asks the Gabbai that he wants to make an announcement. So the Gabbai was very suspicious. Nobody liked this miser in the town, but the Rebbe already clued in the Rav, and the Rav motioned it's okay. And the man goes to the beam and gives a clap. Rabbi Isai, I'm announcing that I'm building a brand new mikvah. Nobly nether. Nobly met nether. Pandemonium breaks out in the shul. The Rebbe is a balmephus. He's a wonder. He's a miracle worker. He's a miracle worker. So much is Shabbos. Already, the Shiva Tuve are here. The seven people of the city go and run to the house with plans, with, 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 with uh, pens in their ear, and he sets the dogs on them. And they run, and what are you doing? Why are you here? We're coming about the mikvah that you promised. There's going to be no mikvah. I lied. Do you hear me? I lied. And they start running away from the dogs, cursing him under their breath. Anyway, a week goes by. Two weeks go by. The Rebbe stayed in the city. Finally, the man makes an appointment with the Rebbe. He comes to the Rebbe and he says, You know, Rebbe, I'm a bit disappointed, to say the least. So the Rebbe said, Why? He says, You know, I was never really liked in this town, but now I am hated. Now, that's okay. To get rid of my wife, I was willing to do that. But she's disgustingly healthy. I mean, she doesn't even have a sniffle. What happened? So the Rebbe looked at him and said to him, let me ask you something. Let me ask you a question. Um, how are things between the two of you? So he says, Rebbe, now you ask me. <laughs> she yells at me, I yell at her. She throws things at me, I throw things at her. What do you think I want to do? So the Rebbe looks at him inquisitively and says, so tell me, when you yell at her, do people hear it? So he said, yeah, we're both healthy. Uh, our voice carries. We, we have the windows open. So the rabbi said, oh, that explains it. You see, 
you're embarrassing her publicly, and it's as if she's already dead. So he says, Rebbe, are you telling me that this is not going to work? So he said, the Rebbe says, no, no, don't get excited, don't get excited, don't lose hope. But what you have to do is, is for the next two weeks, you have to be very nice to her. Then maybe she'll die. And the Bob of a Rebbe used to insert over here and buy her presents. So the man said, Rebbe, there's no other way. He says, no, it's not going to work. He says, okay. Two weeks later, the man comes banging on the door, banging at midnight. The Rebbe is up learning and he comes to the door. He says, what's the matter? What's the matter? He said, Rebbe, you won't understand. He said, what do you mean? He said, remember you told me to be nice to her? He said, yes. Well, you know, I, I, I was nice to her, and I started finding out she's a nice person. You know, I was never nice to her two weeks in a row. But I, I started finding out she's really nice. So Rebbe says, so what's the problem? She's very sick. Oh, my friend, go hurry up and build the mikvah. Now, what's the lesson of this remarkable story? You see, marriage where there is no significant dysfunction. If there's going to be dysfunction, then the normal, um, the normal responses of humanity might not be operating because of serious dysfunction. But if there's not going to be dysfunction, marriage is reciprocal in nature. This we know from the fact that marital joy is described as sus. Sus is a palindrome. It's read backwards and forwards the same way. Because marriage is reciprocal in nature. And when you give something to someone, they naturally respond. And therefore, this man, who wasn't giving to her, she was responding in kind. Now that he, for two weeks, really worked on being nice to her, she started responding. And she started being a pleasure to live with. So therefore, I coined a rule in marriage. And that is, the best way to get something is to give it. And the more you give it, it, it remember, these things don't happen automatically. There's a famous settled cotton. The settled cotton says, this is from the Rebbe Lamelech Belezhensk, Zechitzav V'Kodesh Levracha, the Heilige people run to his gather. The Heilige Rebbe Lamelech Belezhensk says that in order to change something, you have to do it 40 days in a row. That means if you do it 38 days and you miss one day, you got to start from the beginning. And the reason is, why is that? Because it's our bom yoim liyitzira. It takes 40 days to create something new. You, you think it's, why do you think Moshe Rabbeinu was on Har Sinai 40 days and 40 nights? To create a ben toiri, you need 40 days. Why do you think that a woman's mikvah is 40 sa? To, to change from Tumat to tar. Why do you think the marble that had to correct the world was 40 days and 40 nights? It takes 40 days to change something. If let's say a man wants to learn to wake up in the morning and smile at his wife. That's to do it 40 days. 38 days won't cut it. 39 days won't cut it. 40 days. Somebody wants to Complain less. It has to be 40 days. 38 days? No good. To create a new nature. But it happens. The best way to get something is to give it. I'll tell you a story that depicts this. It's an interesting story. It's a true story. A man came to me and said that he hears his wife on the phone and she's laughing, and it fills him with anger. She never laughs with him. Now, I know this man. 
So I, t- I tell him, I'll make up a name. I tell him, Reb Chaim, when was the last time you left? Could I ask you a question? When was the last time you giggled? I'll ask you another question. you even know how to giggle? You're not laughing. She's not laughing with you. Her friends on the phone are laughing. So she's laughing. That's the way human nature works. If we, we could either complain or we could do something about it. You know, people, because people say they want the other person to take the initiative. Right? Now, it's true that the Isha is by nature the one that's in charge of creating the aura and the environment and all. That's the reason why a woman lights Shabbos candles. Okay, it says that he kovaneira shaloylam, she extinguished the light of the world, so she relights it on Friday. We remember it's Friday that Adam and Chava sinned. But the woman is in charge of creating the warmth and the glow of the home. That's why it says in Eishas Chayil, Soifia Halichais Besa. She oversees the ways of her home. That's what it says. But if the woman doesn't do, do it, then the men should do it. The, uh, the man, I mean, after all, the man wants to be happy. If his wife is not seizing the initiative, then the man should do it. I remember years ago when I gave my Daf Yemi in the 14th Avenue Aguda, this is before I was giving in the Svarish Shashul, when the 14th Avenue Aguda in its heyday, the flagship 14th Avenue Aguda, we were uh, Moshe Sherid Avin all the time. Uh, so I gave the Daf there every night. So uh, occasionally, I don't do it anymore, but occasionally people would meet me one time with Shalom Bayez problems. I remember I met a couple, I'll never forget this, this is over 30 years ago, but I met a couple, and first I spoke to the women, a woman alone, and I said, you know, don't give me a laundry list. Let's just, you know, cut to the chase. What's the biggest problem in your marriage? She said, very simple. He's cold as an iceberg. That's it. He's cold. Okay. I said, I hear. She gave me some example. I called in the man. I said, you know, no laundry list. Let's cut to the chase. What? what what's the problem in your marriage? So he looked me straight in the eye and said, she's frigid. You know what an ice cube is? She makes an ice cube look like it's hot tea. This, this is what they both told me. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. So you have to realize, why do you think they got married? They both felt that need. But something happened in the course of their marriage. Interestingly, in this specific situation, it was is that she had a, had a hard pregnancy and then she had postpartum uh, depression and she stopped giving. And she stopped giving, he stopped responding. And that was the beginning of the slide. We have to know that if we want Warmth, we have to give warmth. We have to give it initially without expectation. Then it's going to come. You wait the 40 days. It's going to come back. Whatever we want, whatever is very important, the best way to get something is to give it. That's a tremendous recipe for marriage. Uh, You know, we're just starting the topic. The topic of marriage is uh, one that you cannot speak about in just, uh, you know, one hour. And, uh, you know, as Rev. Yaakov Kamenetsky used to say, that uh, marriage doesn't have a highway that everybody should take. Uh, every marriage needs different things. He used to say that marriage is like a ship at sea. Each boat has to cut its own path through the water. So there is a, a one-size-fits-all recommendation for marriage. Uh, some marriages, the couple needs more time. Other marriages, the tough couple are being stifled and they need space. Right? So there's, 
there's, there's different roads and different needs for each marriage. But I shared with you today, just to review, first of all, Ratzon, will. You know, before I continue the review, again, I want to mention that if you would like to sponsor next week's share, we do not have any sponsors for next week. And, you know, if you've been listening to me and you want to uh, help the share, it's a nice thing to do once in a while. 718-916-3100. If you would like to begin receiving this share by email and getting it earlier in the week. Uh, It's a subscription. It's $26 a month, and I send you the email as soon as I make the share. Again, that's 718-916-3100. RMMWSI at AOL.com. People have asked me, you know, Rabbi Weiss, I can't pay the $360 for the subscription, but I'd like to send some Hakar Satayv. You could do that. You could zell it or PayPal it. Either way, it's to my email, rmmwsi, Rabbi Meshmei Weiss, Staten Island, at aol.com. So let's review. Develop a Ratzin. Realize there's a lot at stake because Ashoi Belayish, Ashoi Belay Shalom, which the stifler of says, is not only somebody that's a bachelor, but also somebody that doesn't have a good marriage. And they ain't Shalom, ain't Klum. Remember that marriage is not natural. That we have to invest first time. Remember that couple, right? The average was 19 minutes a week. That's not going to cut it. Ainasa is time. You have to give time to your marriage. Remember that it's not natural to compliment. It is natural to criticize. It has to be as Rav Keller said. I heard him say, Rav Keller, he passed away this year as a COVID casualty, was one of the great gedolim of yesteryear, I heard him at a good convention say that you should make a quota a week of criticism and never go over that quota. And then you'll catch yourself saying, I don't want to use it up on this. You remember the, what it says in the Svadi Kesuva, Ana Asaber, I will smile. And that the great Rabbi Yechonin said from the Pasuk by Yehuda, that a smile is more important than milk. And remember what we learned from the story of the Baba Varebbe. The best way to get something is to give it. If you want patience, be patient. If you want smile, smile. Laughter, giggle. Time, give time. And the Hashem, the Rabbi Hashem should help us in the fact that we want to better ourselves and listen to such a share, Hashem should grant us all a sweet marriage with Parnasa Berebach of the Kavod and the Biaskel Tzedek Bimher of Yamein.